Good. Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, pleased and honored to be here today as moderator of the uh, session in this conference on the East Mediterranean markets. I would like uh, to thank uh, especially the Hellenic Association for Energy Economics and uh, my friend uh, Kostas uh, for uh, all these organizations. I know it is very difficult to, to put all together in a virtual uh, conference, but we will try today to have an interesting session on, on this interesting region. Uh, let me introduce first uh, the, our esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, we will start by Mr. Dimitris uh, Manolis, who is the head of the International Activities and Project in DEPA, uh, SA. Then uh, we will have Mr. Dan Milstein, uh, Director of European Regional Office uh, in the U.S. Department of Energy at the U.S. Embassy in Prague. Uh, then, uh, then my friend Simon Cassinidis, who is the chairman of uh, uh, DEFA, or natural gas public company in Cyprus. Uh, before uh, uh, ending with uh, Monsieur Marcel Kramer, energy and infrastructure consultant, president, Energy Delta Institute. But let me introduce the subject by uh, a, uh, an overview of the East Mediterranean seen from different perspectives. We have seen Costas now talking about the East Med, but let me uh, put together uh, some slides which will talk about the East Mediterranean, but from really different perspectives. This is a, the, uh, the fruits of a work that we did in the work in the uh, global gas centers, uh, basically for this uh, event. And uh, this is our contribution. And it, it really uh, uh, aim to uh, trigger some discussion on the issues. <clears throat> Okay, we will, I will talk briefly about these uh, issues, undiscovered resources and proved reserves in the region. Then the East Med compared with the other uh, gas-prone uh, region. Uh, the optimal production and timely marketing for the gas in the East Med. The serious challenges that we think are existing in marketing the East Gas Med and some conclusions. Uh, undiscovered resources, we all know that in uh, uh, 209, 10, the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, assessed the undiscovered oil and gas in the region, in the Levant uh, region, which include uh, the offshore of Cyprus, Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. And they reported the undiscovered recoverable gas resources in this basin to be at an average of 122 uh, TCF, trillion cubic feet. Of those, Israel already got proved discovered reserves estimated at 16.4 TCF according to the BP statistical energy reviews in early 2020. Uh, Cyprus recently saw its proven reserves reaching some 20 TCF compared to in initial over-optimistic figures, uh, a hype actually, that we saw 10 years ago at 90, 96 TCF. Lebanon, and based on seismic studies, the undiscovered gas resources are, are estimated at between 15 and 35 TCF while waiting for positive results from the ongoing offshore exploration activities in our country. Syria has plans for gas exploration in its offshore area after signing contracts for five blocks, but these plans have been hindered by the civil war 
and the international sanction on Damascus. What about what, how we compare the East Med to the other uh, gas prone region? And this is important to discuss, to, to see how important and how uh, really uh, imposing could be the region when we talk about the global gas market. In addition to the four uh, East Med market, uh, Cyprus, Lebanon, Israel, and Syria, I can add Egypt, which is playing a major role in this part of the world, with proved reserves of 75.5, according to PP, uh, in early 2020. Then, if we add the undiscovered gas resources estimates of the USGS with the, with the one of Egypt, we end up with around 20 TCF. But this is only compared, with, uh, compared to, to uh, massive proved reserves really, in other regions, like Russia, which got proven reserves of around 1,340, according to BP always, Iran with 1,130, and Qatar with 872 TCF. <coughs> then, the East Med is surely not a very uh, uh, important global gas changer, but it could be a regional one, sure. But also, if only optimally developed, produced, and marketed, and at the right time. <clears throat> Nevertheless, if and how to develop and produce this gas, much, much depends on the form of discoveries. And this is, this people, uh, many, many analysts even, tend to forget that gas discoveries we need to know which kind of gas we will discover and how costly could could be this gas in order to be to be able to market it. And this is very important. We need to, to know the form of the gas, if it is dry, associated, sweet, sour, and the, and the production cost of this gas compared to the value of that gas in the market, in the actual market and the future market. And this is very important. To, to analyze for the future. We believe uh, marketing the gas in the East Med could be easier by using it domestically, as we know as fuel for power and petrochemicals and so on, or exporting it, depending on opportunity to channeling it regionally or on international markets. In the short term, exporting gas found in the East Med would be optimally by channeling it, channeling it as feedstock to the presently idle Egyptian LNG plants, or filling the slightly utilized Arab gas pipeline, which is linking Egypt to Jordan, Syria, uh, and Lebanon, with plans to link with Turkey, and or building and feeding new LNG plants liquefaction plants and gas pipeline, uh, like we, we are hearing, uh, some in, in Cyprus uh, for export, not for import, uh, or the East Gas uh, uh, Pipeline, or some other uh, technically very difficult and politically uh, more challenging than others. Uh, regionally, gas markets, are very small. It could be, be well supplied from within, like for example, Israel already supplying both Egypt and Jordan. Egypt to, doesn't need more gas uh, for itself now. Jordan is oversupplied because they, uh, it is getting gas from Egypt and from, uh, from Israel. And they have also a small LNG import terminal at, at Aqaba. They don't know what to do with all these capacities. Cyprus, uh, they are eyeing to, to channel at least part of its gas to Egypt, while at the same time importing LNG through a, a, a uh, LNG import terminal, uh, which is now being uh, uh, in, in preparation and in construction. <coughs> Egypt is becoming uh, a self-gas-reliant hub country and hopes to find more gas 
allowing it to revive its export outlets and meet its highly subsidized internal demand. When we look at Egypt, we don't look at Egypt only as export uh, country, as export country. We have to look also at the demand locally for gas because it, although they increase the price of the gas internally, gas is still very, uh, uh, the demand for gas internally in Egypt is still growing very steeply. And we have to take this into, into consideration. We have also to look at the large Turkish market, which is near, near, nearby. What is this? Uh, but this need obviously political uh, challenges to be solved, especially with these ter circumstances where Turkey is playing really uh, different roles in the region. Uh, with with uh, what is this? Uh, with Greece, with uh, with Libya, with others. Uh, as we said, Ankara is getting itself involved in serious role with Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt over the region of shore natural gas. Uh, on the global scale, we have to, to see or to say that the unconventional gas revolution, especially, especially the shale gas revolution in the States, and the badly impacted demand due to COVID-19 have oversupplied the world gas market and have pushed the price to low level unseen until now, and are already leading to a race for market share in the global gas market between existing and new LNG suppliers and gas pipeline exporters. At a time when there has been an ongoing fierce competition between gas on one hand and coal and renewable energy sources on the others. What is the conclusion of all, all that for the East Med? The value East Med can get for its gas would be much higher now than in the future because we will see more and more gas coming in the market. We have to profit from this opportunity and develop our gas now and to market it now. <clears throat> Timing is critical. The tardy one would have to deal with rules set up by the more advanced. With each country becoming self gas self-sufficient, regional gas trade becoming more and more difficult. And this is true, this is what, we are, what is happening now. While exporting gas from the region into global gas markets is expected to become tougher and tougher with every passing year, especially that the market, the war on over market share is becoming fierce and fierce with every passing year. Leaving it, really, leaving this East Mediterranean gas only for small dispersed local market if it is not developed and marketed now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> then let us start with Mr. Dimitris Manolis. Good afternoon to all, ladies uh, and gentlemen, um, distinguished uh, guests and, and dear friends. Uh, allow me, first of all, to, to thank uh, the, the Hellenic Association for Energy Economics and all the organizers for organizing this outstanding uh, event. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to, to participate even digitally and speak to you about uh, DEPA's uh, commercial view uh, on uh, small scale LNG projects in our Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. I will put now a presentation on the screen. I hope that everyone can see. Okay, if you can kindly confirm that you, uh, you can see. So, um, 
Uh, I will start with a small uh, introduction about uh, Depa Commercial Group, following the spin-off of some activities and the establishment of Depa Infrastructure, uh, competent for the operation and development of gas distribution uh, networks uh, uh, in the country, and uh, of Depa International Projects, uh, which is competent for the implementation and development of uh, large-scale interconnectors, among uh, which uh, the, the East Med uh, Pipeline project. The DEPA International project is for the time being in 100% uh, subsidiary of DEPA Commercial, but it will be totally transferred as per law provisions to the Hellenic Hydrocarbons Resources Management Company and the Hellenic Petroleum prior to the submission of binding offers for the acquisition of uh, the company. The company is evolving to a modern commercial group in order to address new challenges of the energy market. Now, which are um, our main strategic uh, goals? Our ambition is to evolve from a domestic gas uh, wholesaler to a regional integrated energy company our main strategic goal is to become a key player in the broader region by expanding trading activities while maintaining and continuously improving our competitive and sufficiently diversified natural gas supply portfolio. Uh, the small scale LNG plan of DEPA Commercial is part of its uh, central strategic Goals. Excuse me, Mr. Dimitri, can you open the presentation in a uh, what's full screen? Full screen, uh, I, I think it's view. Not full screen. Now it's in full screen. I hope it can be seen now. Okay, I, I, I will continue. So, um, coming now to the key markets for small scale LNG in, uh, in general, but in particular in, in, in our uh, area. LNG can ensure sustainable energy growth as it provides a solution the natural gas supply of power plants, industrial, commercial, and domestic consumers in areas far from the gas transmission and distribution networks, such as in Western Greece and the country's main islands. Uh, the potential of its use as a fuel in transport, road and sea, is also particularly important. It is worth noting that the greatest positive effect of the use of LNG on the islands results from the use of LNG as a marine fuel. Merchant shipping, along with tourism, tourism, are the pillars of the national economy. Also, many Greek ports are located at strategic points and are important poles of investment from the commercial but also touristic point of view. The ports of our islands are especially busy during the summer. The environmental impact of ports in the form of gaseous pollutants on the atmosphere and human health is extremely important. A recent study that has been conducted by the School of Production and Management Engineering of the Technical University of Crete, in collaboration with the Energy Management Research Center, estimated the economic cost of gaseous pollutants of cruise ships in areas close to the five busiest Greek cruise ports, meaning Piraeus, Santorini, Mykonos, Corfu and Katako. It was estimated that the annual cost of the expected impact on the health on, of the population could reach 24.3 million euros or 5.3 euros per cruise passenger. The above figures prove the need to take measures and adopt appropriate policies to reduce emissions generated by cruise ships and coastal ships or cargo ships in the ports, not only of our island, islands, but also of Greece as a whole. 
the use of LNG in ships enables the reduction of operating costs since the natural gas the LNG as a fuel is more economical than oil and achieves a significant reduction of gas emissions in the respective ports and consequently on the islands. With the creation of the appropriate infrastructure, the use of LNG by the local economies of the islands will be promoted both due to its low cost and due to its reduced environmental impact on the health of our islanders in comparison to oil. LNG can play a complementary role in interconnecting the islands. The specific role can be played either by acting as a precursor of clean energy supply of the respective island and the shipping sector until the final decision of construction of the interconnection and completion of its work or as a partner in energy supply on the islands, actively participating in clean energy supply. It should be emphasized that here in Greece, due to the European directives and central government initiatives, is steadily moving towards the use of a cleaner power plants, withdrawing the old costly polluting lignite units, which reduce the country's energy efficiency. Significant steps have been taken with the construction of new clean units. LNG infrastructure construction, in this case, can play an important role in ensuring the country's energy adequacy in the near future. The above actions can play an important role for the energy independence of the islands by contributing to their economic development in a clean environment. An important role for the implementation of these actions is to find the best way to contribute to the clean development of the islands with the investments from both interconnections and LNG, which will be sustainable while meeting all the needs of the islands. LNG will keep gaining momentum as an alternative and cleaner fuel for road, marine and industrial uses, supported by promising business cases. Now, which are the main drivers of growth for, uh, for small-scale LNG projects in Greece? First of all, the strategic geographical position of the country. Greece is bounded on the west by the Ionian Sea, on the south by the Mediterranean, and on the east by the Aegean Sea, an arm of the Mediterranean. Greece has 13,700 kilometers of sea coast. Greek sovereign land includes 6,000 islands and is less scattered by the Aegean and the Ionian Sea, which only 227 islands are inhabited. This is a truly unique phenomenon for the European continent. Greece has, as of year 1999, an operative LNG terminal in Revithusa, meanwhile a second one in its final investment phase of uh, development, and in which Depa Commercial holds a 20% stake. This is the Alexandripolis uh, FSA. Unfortunately, my, my dear friend Kostis Ipneos was unable to participate in the session and update us on the status of development of this really important project for the entire region. Greece is a country of seamen with a strong potential demand in shipping, such as short sea shipping, cruise ships, container vessels, etc. Greece is a maritime nation by tradition a shipping is arguably the oldest form of occupation of the Greeks and has been a key element of Greek economic activity since ancient times. Shipping is the country's most important industry, worth $22 billion uh, in 2018. If related businesses are added, the figure jumps to, 20, to almost $24 billion. Uh, uh, employs about 400,000 people that represent 14% of the entire workforce. In 2018, the Greek merchant navy controlled the world's largest mercant fleet in terms of tonnage, with a total deadweight tonnage of 835 million tons and a fleet of 5,626 Greek-owned vessels, 
according to the Lloyd's list. Greece is also ranked in the top of all kinds of ships, including first for tankers and bulk carriers. LNG is, in, is being increasingly adopted by commercial navigation companies, especially passenger, to replace fuel oil or gas oil, also in compliance with uh, stricter emission standards. Road transportation has potential for fuel switching, going forward driven by emission restriction trends. The, at the end, the Greek industry is far behind current EU average oil consumption, uh, just to consider that oil penetration in industrial uh, segments in Greece is up to 25 higher than the EU average. Last but not least, the fact that there are high density residential areas and industrial commercial customers in Western Greece uh, that do not have any access to natural gas. Based on the geographical uh, characteristics of the country, the necessity to adapt its activities in the new greener area and its long run expertise in the implementation of innovative projects, DEPA Commercial has focused in the implementation of its strategy on bunkering, off-grid industrial commercial customer supply, and gas for transportation activities. Thanks to its long-lasting experience in the development of EU projects, the strategic planning division of the company participates in the development of the following uh, projects. The Poseidon Med 2, the Blue Hubs, and Super Green. Let's see uh, the main characteristics of each. So, the Poseidon Med is a key European project aiming to take all the necessary steps forward and towards the adoption of LNG as a marine fuel in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea while making uh, Greece an international marine bunkering and distribution hub for LNG in Southeastern Europe. DEPA Commercial is the coordinator of this project. Poseidon Made 2 is a practical roadmap which aims to bring about the wide adoption of LNG as a safe, environmentally efficient and viable alternative fuel for shipping and help the Eastern Mediterranean marine transportation propel towards a low carbon future. The project, which is co-funded by the European Union, involved three countries, Greece, Italy, and Cyprus, six European ports, Piraeus, Patras, Limassol, Venice, Heraklion, and Igumenica, as well as the Arabithusa LNG terminal. The project brings together top experts from the marine, energy, and financial sectors to design an integrated LNG value chain and establish a well-functioning and sustainable LNG market. Coming now to the to Super Green, this project constitutes a holistic approach towards the electrification and utilization of alternative fuels of shipping in Greece by implementing innovative technological systems based on a market-oriented approach. The main objective is the design, construction, and operation of hybrid LNG fueled vessels, and DEPA Commercial is contributing to the project as partnered with the purchase of two LNG semi-trailers from ba for bankering the vessels. The pro this procurement is co-financed by the European uh, Super Green Action for the amount of 2.1 million euros. A new tender related to the procurement of the LNG semi-trailers and the maintenance and service for a period of two years was launched last summer. And relevant offers are expected to be submitted on the 6th of October. Coming now to the Blue Hubs project, the action is motorways of the sea wider benefit project contributed to environmental gains in maritime transport. It aims at establishing the fundamental supply chains for the distribution of natural gas to port users in the forms of LNG for the vessels and LNG or compressed natural gas CNG for port heavy duty vehicles and buses. The action 
is consistent with the overall EU strategy for a more resource efficient Europe and utilizes alternative energy sources in a manner to minimize environmental impact. In addition to the 9 million euros of EU grants, and I'm making reference to the commercial quota, the company has signed on at the end of January 2020 a 20 million loan agreement with uh, EIB for the construction of a 3,000 cubic meters LNG vessel to be based in the port of the area. The relevant EU tender, which is, has been launched formally in the negotiated procedure with prior call for competition uh, for the vessel construction, is ongoing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude this presentation by noting our strategic advantages that we believe that will allow us to achieve the goals set up in our uh, small scale LNG projects. DEPA Commercial is the leading gas importer and supplier in Greece with a strong financial position and extended experience in LNG supply contracts and has also an extensive experience in the implementation of projects. We firmly believe that we will succeed. Thank you very much for your attention. For this very interesting uh, presentation, we move now to Mr. Milstein for his uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon. That is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, my name is Dan Milstein. I'm the director of the European Regional Office of the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, it's an honor to participate in this symposium uh, virtually from here in Prague. Uh, I very much hope this video connection is working well and that my two-year-old does not wake up before I'm done talking. Uh, I agreed to say a few uh, words on this panel about small-scale LNG applications, but I think the ground was covered very well just there. Uh, uh, I, I, will, uh, I will add a few comments about small-scale LNG, but uh, first permit me to uh, deliver this, uh, this message from my sponsor, the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, the shale revolution has propelled the U.S. to become the world's largest produce, producer of natural gas. The U.S. is now in its fourth consecutive year as a net natural gas exporter and has a, a current export capacity of, of over 9 billion cubic feet per day, putting us among the top three LNG exporters in the world. U.S. dry natural gas production set a record last year, averaging 92.2 billion cubic feet per day. Uh, EIA forecasts dry natural gas production will average 89.7 uh, billion cubic feet per day in 2020, with monthly production falling from 96.2 BCF per day in November to 83.6 in March 2021. Uh, U.S. LNG export capacity is now higher than it's ever been. By the end of this year, we'll have 10 billion cubic feet per day, which is equivalent to 102 billion cubic meters per year of export capacity online. And once all the export capacity under construction is in place, uh, which we expect around 2025, we'll have over 15 billion cubic feet per day in place, uh, more than any other country. The United States government is com committed to supporting energy security in Europe, including through natural gas supply and supply route diversification. Europe was the top importing region of US LNG last year in 2019. In fact, we've been the largest LNG exporter to Europe since November. And in February this year, US LNG uh, exports reached a record new high of over 5 billion cubic feet per day, nearly double the volume of Europe's second largest supplier, Qatar. These imports are having a positive impact on the continent. Uh, and according to the International Energy Agency, Europe paid $8 billion less in 2018 for natural gas because of the Im impact on the market of US production and exports. So there are real advantages uh, to using LNG. Uh, and from U.S. increased LNG uh, liquefaction and exports. It's a flexible, clean, cost-competitive fuel, and consumers know they can rely on the rule of law and the sanctity of contracts when doing business with the United States. We also have a transparent market that extends to the transparency of information on the environmental footprint of our natural gas across its life cycle, from production to transport to liquefaction. Every stage is measured and reported in a transparent and open manner to ensure accountability and inspire confidence among our partners as they complement renewables uh, with other sources. So um, 
that's in a nutshell the picture uh, from America. Uh, turning now to small scale energy applications, which is what I agreed to uh, uh, to address when uh, when Costas gave me a call. Um, let me just say, uh, you know, up front that although LNG is generally thought of as just another source of gas, albeit one that has to be liquefied at an LNG export terminal and regasified at an LNG import terminal, LNG is a lot more than that. Its market potential is not limited to the same end users that are supplied with gas by pipeline from other sources. Uh, there are other applications and other ways of delivering LNG to end users for those applications. Um, it's usually, you know, I mean, the market today, it's, it's you know, usually regas and delivered to end users by pipe. Uh, but as an energy dense liquid fuel, LNG can also be thought of as a relatively inexpensive, cleaner burning alternative to oil as a transportation fuel and not just an alternative source of gas. Uh, the, the last presentation, um, you know, really hit on, you know, LNG as a, as a marine fuel and also as a, a alternative fuel for heavy trucks as well. And that's, uh, uh, that's what I'm going to address a bit, bit more here today. Um, I mean, the market for transportation fuels is enormous. Uh, if you look at a, you know, on a, uh, in terms of, you know, energy content and also the, uh, measured in euros, this is a bigger market, uh, by far than, than gas and the European continent. Uh, so LNG as a transportation fuel is a nascent market, but it's a, it's an exciting one to watch it develop here in Europe. And it, LNG looks set to become an important transportation fuel in Europe for ships and heavy trucks, uh, in, in part because it's a lower cost fuel than diesel and also because of its uh, clear environmental advantages. Uh, and because of these economic, environmental and energy security benefits from having a diversity of uh, energy supplies. Um, uh, the EU's alternative fuel infrastructure directive, which I believe was adopted in 2014, prudently obliges all EU member states to deploy LNG refueling infrastructure for heavy duty trucks along key highways and at maritime ports by the end of 2025. This obligation, uh, this regulatory obligation was created uh, with the intention of solving or resolving the kind of chicken and egg dilemma of, you know, the owner of a heavy truck fleet or a ship fleet will face when contemplating a purchase of an LNG fueled ship or truck uh, without a reliable and convenient uh, place to refuel. You know, it's not really a realistic prospect to buy an LNG fueled vehicle. Um, so it's it's a nascent market, but like I said, the, the, the developments are are exciting. Italy and Spain are the furthest along uh, with, with the development of inland refueling infrastructure. Italy has 78 LNG filling stations for heavy trucks, and Spain has 58. Um, with no filling LNG filling stations, uh, Greece and Cyprus have some catching up to do, but logistically speaking, it looks very straightforward. Uh, the last presentation mentioned the existence of the Revithusa terminal, uh, the expectation of a net positive FID on the Alexandropoli uh, FSRU. So the supply chains, I, you know, without getting into details, I, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and Greece and the region are in a, a very excellent position to transition to LNG as a, as a transportation fuel. So DEP is not wrong to put that in its uh, core business. So, uh, you know, uh, demand creation. Uh, I, I want to point out the, um, uh, the, you know, last year's adoption of the first ever EU-wide CO2 emission standards for heavy-duty vehicles. I, I think this is uh, very quietly, but importantly, likely to accelerate the demand growth for LNG as a transportation fuel in the EU. The uh, the directive mandates a fifth, that manufacturers. I believe it's the average of their uh, uh, the truck fleet that they have on the market uh, requires a 15% CO2 uh, emissions reduction target for trucks starting in 2025. So talking to industry and uh, truck manufacturers, right now LNG fuel trucks can meet that target because of the lower emissions associated with LNG fuel trucks. 
compared to a diesel truck. To squeeze out an additional 15% efficiency from a diesel truck, um, not, a, uh, not an engineer, but my understanding is this is basically all the efficiencies have already been squeezed out. So, there will, so my expectation is, and the, well, paraphrasing the expectation of industry experts, uh, there's going to be there's going to be a, a nonlinear shift uh, as a result of this regulatory change. So, um, and it's not just CO two. Um, LNG fuel trucks are also far better from a local air quality perspective, uh, emitting essentially no particulate matter nor any sulfur oxides, which is uh, you know a very important consideration for urban areas with local air quality problems to solve. Um, so the, the the last count that I heard, uh, I guess this would have been in July, was that there are now 9,000 LNG fuel trucks operating in the EU today. It's not a huge number, but this is a rapid growth from a near zero baseline just you know, a handful of years ago. Uh, the market is, uh, you know, the largest market share is by Italy's Aveco, but uh, Scania and Volvo also uh, sell LNG fuel trucks on the European market today. Uh, so. It, you know, repeating myself a bit. So environmental regulations are part of what's driving demand and will in the future, but also uh, financial incentives. Germany recently saw a sharp uptick uh, from their baseline in LNG fuel truck registrations after offering rebates for purchasers of new LNG fuel trucks that mostly, but not entirely covered the, uh, the cost delta uh, uh, between LNG fuel trucks and diesel fuel trucks. Uh, additionally, I believe it was a two-year uh, holiday on paying highway tolls for uh, newly registered LNG fuel trucks. So that's a clear financial incentive for owners of uh, uh, truck fleets, you know, logistics companies and whatnot. So uh, another important kind of demand creation tools that, uh, or or you know, vice you know, uh, conversely. Uh, it's very important on relative tax treatment between diesel fuel and LNG. Uh, that's a critical factor. Uh, how these governments tax these fuels in, you know, relative to each other will have a big impact on the market. Uh, notably, Poland reduced the excise tax on LNG to zero last year, uh, which the European Commission found was uh, uh, that that was entirely legal uh, for ships. So I've mostly been talking about trucks, but uh, in the East Mediterranean. Um, a lot of ships. So stringent new rules under the MARPOL convention uh, about sulfur oxide emissions from ships is also driving interest in LNG as a maritime fuel. The International Maritime Organization IMO 2020 regulations that went into effect on the 1st of January this year uh, reduced the limit on sulfur content in ships fuel oil to half a percent. That was a, a big step down from the three and a half percent uh, maximum just last year. Uh, and that's that's global, that's global. So, you know, compliance can either be, you know, uh, retrofitting scrubbers on existing ships or if, uh, you know, ships have a long, long lifetime, but uh, for those uh, uh, ship owners that are, you know, thinking about buying a new ship, it's, um, you know, uh, I've, I heard one ferry owner describe LNG ships as being, you know, Future proof from a from a regulatory perspective, because there are no sulfur oxide emissions from uh, from burning LNG. Um, with support now, I guess uh, also under the Marpol Convention, uh, certain bodies of water can be designated as emissions control areas, which have even you know it's basically another order of magnitude uh, more stringent uh, in terms of sulfur oxide emissions. And the Mediterranean, there's um, there's an active discussion about designating the Mediterranean, including the Aegean, as an emissions control area. So uh, Italy, Spain, and France are now all on board with that designation. I uh, confess I don't know where the government of Greece stands on it. Um, but if you have the expectation that there could be or will be even more stringent environmental regulations on uh, marine fuels, then it would be uh, almost reckless not to consider LNG fueled ships uh, uh, at, at such a point that uh, investment decisions are being made. Um, so all these, all these factors point towards increasing the use of LNG as a transportation fuel in Europe. 
um, and new customers for LNG suppliers to serve. Um, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, LNG is not just an alternative source of gas. It's not just bring it to a regas terminal, turn it back into a relatively low energy density fuel that can only be delivered by pipeline to the same customers that are supplied today with other sources of uh, gas by pipeline. You know, I'm, I'm harping on uh, the transportation sector and as a as an alternative uh, liquid fuel because um, uh, I, I don't want to talk all day, but uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 not the same. If if I can get one message across, that's that LNG is a more versatile fuel. Um, briefly, you know, given that it's uh, HAEE organizes organizing this event, would be remiss if I didn't mention the great potential, or I should say, repeat uh, what was mentioned about the great potential for small scale LNG for serving energy needs in island communities. Greek islands that are not connected to the mainland electrical grid have long been powered with diesel generators. And without going into the details, LNG is an, uh, an immediate fuel option and small scale LNG is an excellent fit uh, for the needs of these islands. Uh, in the US, we are seeing strong interest in small scale LNG, particularly for exports to islands in the uh, Caribbean. I think this is a close analogy. Uh, one US company has exported over 400 shipments of small scale LNG from its facility in Florida to Barbados, the Bahamas, uh, Haiti, and Jamaica over the last four years. The LNG is used for power generation and industrial applications. And I'm familiar with one project which was uh, supplying US LNG to a rum producer in Jamaica, which I think is uh, an incredibly good use for the fuel. So uh, I will pause and I, I, won't, I won't get into kind of uh, supply logistics, but uh, just to uh, say again, you know, uh, having LNG infrastructure already in place in Greece and in the Eastern Mediterranean region makes it a lot easier to uh, develop uh, a small scale LNG ecosystem. You know, uh, I, I need to ask Despa where they are exactly on the truck reloading project that they had uh, uh, planned for the Revithusa uh, terminal. You know, uh, very near Athens. That would that would be um, you know small investment with uh, I think tremendous upside in terms of opening up new markets. Uh, Alexandropoli, uh, if there's ship, you know, I mean obviously that's going to be uh, that FSRU would be I think it's ten kilometers offshore. So truck reloading not exactly an option, but ship to ship reloading or uh, feeder vessels. I think there's a lot of potential. Um, uh, yeah, not going into details, but the island of Crete and its its power generation needs. I, I think uh, uh, LNG is a perfect fit. Could deliver it right there to a uh, power plant, you know, on the coast, and um, and have a cleaner power generation source there. So uh, I think I've said more then, than enough. Then else. maybe maybe we have to summarize a little bit and and uh, finalize because we're out of time. Please. I, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for this very, really, very interesting uh, review of the situation from Prague uh, on the U.S. and the East Mediterranean. Now let us see the situation from Nicosia with uh, Dr. Kassidianiadis, who is the chairman of uh, the Natural Gas Public Company in Cyprus. Hi, Energy. Thank you Hi. for uh, giving me the opportunity to present the, uh, the status of the LNG import terminal for Cyprus. Uh, as uh, we heard a number of uh, speakers uh, previously talking about that, and, uh, and everything almost said uh, fits into what uh, our plans are. And I think, like, uh, right now, it's uh, maybe putting, let's say, some more structure and, and more specific uh, uh, view. So let me... Uh, okay. I'm trying to share the screen. Okay, so I will talk and give an update uh, generally for the Cyprus LNG import terminal uh, for uh, to remind uh, 
those that uh, know uh, I'm having difficulty in uh... Can you see my screen? can see it. We can see it properly. You can see it properly. Okay. One second. Put it on a uh, presenter view. Yes. Yeah, I was trying to do that. So. Yes, this one. Now you can see it, huh? Yes. All right. So... All right, so the, the project uh, basically involves the acquisition of an FSRU. Uh, you see the, on the right is, let's say, a mock-up of the, an aerial photograph of the area of uh, the Basilicos uh, port. Uh, we have the construction of uh, a jetty, it's a 1.3 kilometer uh, jetty, uh, where the FSRU will be berthed, so we have uh, berthing and mooring equipment. Uh, if you notice, there's a faint uh, red line. I'll come back to that. That is a possible extension for the for the jetty uh, for future uh, uses. Uh, then we have jetty-borne uh, gas pipelines, uh, loading arm, uh, construction of an onshore gas uh, pipeline, uh, shore side above ground installations. Let's say pressure reduction and metering stations. And there is, a, a, in the first instance, let's say, a construction of a pipeline storage array, uh, let's say, which will allow, will act as a natural gas buffer solution to allow, let's say, in the event that the ship needs to uh, leave, uh, to allow, let's say, the power generation to, to switch to liquid fuels, uh, which are being reserved, let's say, for emergency situations. Uh, our project is uh, being uh, handled by ETIFA. ETIFA is now the uh, subsidiary of uh, VEFA, which is uh, the natural gas uh, public company of Cyprus. ETIFA is the natural gas infrastructure company of Cyprus, and we have the, uh, the shareholding is 70% VEFA and 30% is with the electricity authorities that have taken uh, a stake in the, in the infrastructure company. DEFA has the exclusive right for uh, import and distribution of natural gas in Cyprus. Uh, and uh, also, ETIFA will be the, the has the, let's say, the uh, monopoly, it will be a monopoly for the regasification for a number of, uh, of years going forward. Uh, the project uh, status today. Uh, we have the EPCOM uh, contract, EPCOM being uh, EPC plus operations and maintenance. This was given to a consortium of uh, a CPP, China Petroleum uh, Pipeline Engineering, uh, together with uh, Metron. Uh, Metron is a Greek company. Then uh, Hudong Xinhua Shipbuilding is the one who is undertaking the, uh, the conversion of the ship. Uh, the ship is actually uh, an ex-shell uh, ship, uh, Galea, uh, has already been acquired and is already first in the shipyards to start a uh, uh, project, let's say. Then uh, our project uh, has also the operation and maintenance that has been undertaken by Wilkinson Ship Management for a period of 20 years, uh, with the Republic having the right to uh, let's say exit in the first uh, 10 years, assuming that uh, uh, DEFA, DEFA has the capability to do so and run the operation by itself. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, how it actually is seen through uh, from the coast, where it actually fits uh, in the Vasilikos port in, uh, uh, in Limassol area. Uh, 
Recently, also, we have awarded the contract for owners engineers. Uh, this is a consortium of Hill International and Bureau Veritas. And uh, also, they are supported by Tractabel and Gazocean in order to ensure we look at the owners engineers as uh, a very important part of the team in order for us to be able to monitor and, and execute this uh, very important and mission critical application for the Republic of, uh, of Cyprus. The, finally, the insurance advisors which we have been selected uh, and we will be soon uh, uh, informing people about that as well. Now, the, the project, I said, uh, has started. The project, talking a little bit uh, about the financials, uh, the tender uh, award had a 289 million euro contract for CapEx and uh, a 210 million uh, for OPEX for the operations and maintenance uh, for the next uh, 20 years. Then uh, we secured uh, a grant from the uh, CEF Energy, uh, let's say with uh, a maximum of 101 million euro uh, is a grant. Uh, the, I mentioned the Electricity Authority taking a, a shareholding in the infrastructure company and for that they had an equity contribution of 43 million. So effectively we have 144 million that are taken as uh, equity. Uh, and then we have secured uh, uh, credit uh, financing from EIB uh, with, uh, let's say, 150 million euro loans for 20 years uh, duration with uh, favorable terms and EBRD uh, for a uh, similar type of an arrangement for 80 million uh, euro. That uh, puts the available capital for uh, for the EPIFA, for the project and so forth, uh, up to 374 million. Uh, it's now a matter of, let's say, uh, proceeding to execute. And uh, as I said, the clock has already uh, started uh, ticking, uh, and we are expecting delivery of, uh, of the uh, finished uh, project uh, by September 2022. Other uh, activities that we have uh, right now uh, ongoing is uh, we are in the process uh, almost a year ago a bit over a year ago we announced uh, a tender for supply for the supply of, uh, of lng uh, and uh, we truly waited until everything was ready and for the project to actually start before we proceeded with uh, that uh, phase to proceed with the procurement now we had requested uh, the evaluation of, uh, a, let's say, expression of interest to supply LNG uh, to Cyprus. We had interest expressed from 25 uh, organizations from, around, from all over the world. Uh, the evaluation that was covering both uh, SPAs and MSAs, uh, so an SPA will be a three to five year cover, uh, uh, let's say, base load quantities, and the MSA will be giving us the ability to uh, purchase on the market for supplementary cargoes. Our intent is uh, all the companies that uh, qualify, uh, let's say we will sign as many MSAs as uh, are qualified, but of course one uh, for uh, the SPA. Uh, the evaluations is uh, is being uh, done as uh, as we speak, and uh, we think that before the end of the month uh, will be completed, and then early in 2021 we will issue the actual formal uh, RFP for uh, for the supply, for the financials and so. Forth. The this uh, in a way is also related uh, will be related with an open season process. Uh, we have uh, this to determine the major end users, uh, the quantities per user, the spatial allocation, 
and so forth, uh, which basically also defines our development of an infrastructure, whether it's going to be a virtual infrastructure, whether it's going to be pipeline across the island, and so forth. Already we have three licensed IPPs that uh, are interested to take uh, uh, gas for uh, conventional power generation. We have, uh, since uh, we informed that we have started the project, a number of the, uh, let's say, alternative uh, renewable uh, energy producers uh, have approached us because they want to uh, supplement, especially solar uh, producers, they want to introduce the capability of uh, topping up uh, in the evening, let's say, or uh, when you have uh, low solar uh, generation with gas turbines. Uh, we have uh, new interest and so forth. So the open season is becoming more of a, a necessity that is something that is being planned to start and, and happen also again early next year. The, this uh, leads to the pipeline. We have uh, in Cyprus, uh, there was a, a, a design for a pipeline to take uh, from Vasilikos to the Kelia, which is across, uh, across let's say, the main uh, island. And uh, that uh, was uh, renewed the study. And right now we are going to go uh, by mid next year uh, plan to have a, a tender for, uh, let's say, con beginning the construction of the development uh, for, uh, for doing that. So all these three things are in a way interrelated and uh, very important. Uh, finally, the other projects uh, that are uh, in discussions and uh, uh, the bunkering, we see bunkering for Cyprus as being a very uh, important uh, uh, part of, uh, of our uh, strategy. Uh, we think that uh, Cyprus can indeed uh, have a role uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean for uh, uh, refueling of, uh, of ships, uh, for uh, let's say, and already the designs for our uh, FSRU and our LNG uh, terminal is are such that uh, allow the operation of the terminal also for uh, bunkering. We are in discussions, uh, uh, Mr. Manolis from Weber mentioned the Blue Hubs. We are in discussions with Blue Hubs as well, and there are plans to have a bunkering vessel uh, in Cyprus, which will be supplied from, uh, from the FSRU. Uh, so we think that uh, we have also uh, the engagement and support of uh, the Ministry of uh, tourism, the Ministry of uh, Shipping, and so it is something that we are taking uh, a serious look at. Uh, it was uh, good to hear before about uh, the gas for Rome. Uh, we have some interesting, let's say, uh, approaches uh, for using uh, LNG and making gas available for industrial applications. And road transport is another uh, another thing that uh, uh, we are exploring. I should uh, mention that, uh, let's say, uh, on the small scale LNG, for us also the idea of uh, micro LNG stations is uh, very important, uh, uh, creating maybe a virtual network to supply areas. Cyprus is generally quite mountainous and uh, the possibility of having uh, multiple pipelines is not really there, but let's say uh, we could see that uh, there is a need to take uh, LNG for uh, different applications in the tourist areas to service, let's say, a hotel uh, district or industrial district and so forth. Uh, so what is the key message? The key message uh, for us here is that uh, after many, many years of uh, uh, Cyprus trying to uh, bring LNG to Cyprus uh, and change its uh, fuel for uh, energy generation. If you saw uh, the presentation in the previous uh, session, let's say uh, Cyprus uh, energy is uh, almost exclusively or to a very great percentage oil, uh, uh, oil products, uh, which is... Uh, something that we've had to change, it's expensive, it's dirty, 
so we are moving into gas. Uh, the project has uh, started. Uh, it's not related to the to the discovery and uh, monetization of our reserves. Uh, however, our infrastructure allows for potential future plants uh, for extensions of the facilities to allow for export if that time uh, comes and when that time comes. But in the meantime, we perceive that uh, the gas is coming for, uh, let's say, for the through the terminal as an import uh, uh, fuel will lead to the creation of new jobs, increased, let's say, uh, revenues for uh, local companies, increase of uh, foreign direct investment, uh, new technological uh, research uh, through our universities and our research centers, and effectively we'll see uh, a, a, as an injection and, and boost uh, for uh, our economy. Uh, I mentioned uh, two characteristics, uh, the, the opening up of the electricity market by the activation of the independent power producers, but as well making the reality projects like uh, that are now happening, uh, like the EuroAsia and the EuroAfrica interconnectors, uh, where let's say Cyprus becomes a node, so uh, that comes as a comment, let's say, to what is all this power generation in Cyprus going to do when, when the needs are, are limited. So I think we have a good plan, uh, good progress, and uh, hopefully, let's say, after a couple of years, uh, you will all be able to come and visit our facilities. Uh, with that, I will close. Thank you, Najib. And, uh... Thank you, Simeon, for this update. We are uh, really running out of time. Uh, let us uh, move to Mr. Kramer, Marcel Kramer, with uh, some uh, uh, of his remarks. Please. If you can put the micro, your micro is, out, is off. Should yes. be on now. Sorry for yes, that. Uh, pleasure to be here. And, uh, and yes, in the interest of time uh, and with your uh, encouragement, moderator, I'll try to be uh, relatively short. A lot of good and interesting things have been said by all the participants. <clears throat> but allow me to try and, and maybe not summarize, but pick out a few points that certainly from my experience, uh, and with the perspective that we're happy to have, for example, as a as an international energy business school, uh, Energy Delta Institute, uh, that we we see a lot of the developments from nearby and get some interesting input. Um, if if you look at regional market development, really, uh, I guess there are a number of key points to make that are, if you want, preconditions or important elements that, uh, with a helicopter view, give you a feel for whether such market development is actually going to take place or not. Uh, because there are many places in the world where there is that potential in essence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that things will work out, that the development will be there, and that you know, all the conditions that need to be met for successful market development over many, many years, because the, it's a very long-term investment type of market, that, that the market development will indeed come to fruition. Uh, first of all, you know, the observations uh, on key factors have to do, of course, with, with demand development. Uh, we know that... Uh, you know, the region is made up of a number of larger markets, certainly by average European standards, but also quite a few very small markets. Uh, and so the question is whether the gas penetration, as we would call it, can indeed take place into both. Um, what we see is that there is a growing realization that natural gas uh, can play a very favorable role 
in terms of its environmental benefits as a strong partner for renewables, particularly to deal with intermittency and so on. Uh, and gas, uh, as was said before, of course, uh, uh, compressed or as LNG has real potential also in the transport sector. But let's not forget that that is only a fraction of overall gas demand. Uh, there are significant air quality benefits. That's a very important point, often underestimated by uh, the ones who uh, who talk about gas markets and the benefits of gas. But I think Dan Milstein was absolutely right uh, to highlight that again. Uh, you know, even here in the Netherlands, and we're known to be a fairly clean and organized place. Um, there is uh, a significant number of uh, deaths related annually to poor air quality. And that applies to many pockets across Europe. Uh, and whatever we can do through adequate gas supply and gas consumption to mitigate that should be very, very welcome. Um, so that's an important point to mention. Uh, that's on the demand side. On the pricing side, there's another issue. In a number of markets, and I happen to have come across that as I worked in various parts of the world, uh, there has been a, uh, an attempt or a tendency, if you want, by, by local governments to insist on a certain portion of uh, upstream developed uh, gas resources to be sent into domestic markets. That in itself is very positive. Uh, the issue, however, has been that domestic gas pricing did not allow for an adequate return. And uh, as we know, for example, in LNG markets, where the returns are highly uncertain and there's also a lot of volatility, uh, you know, that added disadvantage of what one might call uh, a domestic pricing system which is too far removed from world market pricing can really be a big issue in terms of being an obstacle for upstream development. It should not be underestimated, it's a significant factor. So that pricing issue uh, is important, needs to be looked at by governments uh, and needs to be put in a bigger picture of the importance of getting upstream development going. <clears throat> when it comes to infrastructure, of course, important. Uh, I think you know we've all seen uh, pretty good developments in the region over the past decade. That has to do also with upstream supply, and we'll come back to that. Um, but you know there have been improvements, and we have just heard the example of Cyprus. But you know many many projects there, many ideas, but also money being put on the on the table. Um, the same is true, I think, in other parts of the region. And there's certainly now a window of opportunity with relatively low capital costs. At the same time, of course, the oil and gas industry in general is not exactly celebrating its abundance these days when it comes uh, to talking to the CFOs in particular. So, you know, there's an issue about pricing being fair and reasonable, and an issue around the financing of infrastructure, which very often depends on the key resource holders when they have to push that infrastructure forward in order to further ensure market development. Uh, LNG development, there's been quite a bit of it. Most of it has been small. And of course, what's interesting and in itself very positive is that we see you know, compared to, let's say, the, a decade ago, uh, a much clearer trend towards a modular approach, the ability to start with smaller terminals, with FSRUs, and gradually build up as the market grows, thereby minimizing capital expenditure and also an element of risk uh, through that modular approach. Uh, we see it in Croatia, we talk about it in Greece, we talk about it in other places in the region as well. Uh, and I think that that's something which, when you look at the structure of the infrastructure overall, is an important development that has really helped and will continue to help uh, reaching what one might call smaller markets for, for LNG in particular. 
Um, you know, of course, and we've talked about this, other, other various speakers have, uh, market development is being supported when the region has significant uh, gas supply potential or, or ample opportunity to source gas either from within the region or from nearby. That is likely to have a cost advantage, uh, but there's also an upstream push to bring that gas to market. And these two factors together uh, can indeed really accelerate gas development and, and, and accelerate the development of that market. Um, in that sense, of course, the Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean has very favorable characteristics. Um, in the surrounding countries, obviously, uh, we see that with gas coming from Azerbaijan, we see it with gas coming from Russia, but also within the region in a larger sense, uh, itself, uh, particularly if you include Egypt, you know, and if you look only 10 years back, and this industry, as most of you know, 10 years is not a very long time, you see, uh, first of all, about a decade ago, I think, the developments in uh, the resource base in Israel and Cyprus, and then again, you know, the, the large, very large Egyptian discoveries that have triggered uh, a lot of activity, and in the Egyptian case, already based on fairly significant infrastructure that can be extended uh, in all likelihood very cost effectively. And frankly, I, I do see Egypt uh, playing uh, an increasingly important role in uh, also in, in regional supply. Um, you know, with all of that, uh, one could be fairly optimistic. Uh, there are reports that say, well, the region is not that important, you know, 25 BCM or so of demand. These are the kinds of numbers that are being mentioned. But I would point out that uh, for various reasons, even an increase, which by global standards may not be very large, is truly important for the region's economic development for employment, also in the shorter term, which is increasingly important, I think, uh, but in terms also of uh, making the share of gas in the region more relevant, more important, thereby bringing significant diversification and also uh, environmental benefits. Um, there's a lot of work to do there, and I think what's encouraging is that the companies that are involved in the regions, including the ones involved in this important conference, uh, are really taking the bull by the horns and are coming up with lots of ideas, with proposals, with projects for the benefit of their customers. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kramer, with this optimistic and uh, encouraging note, maybe we have to conclude because we are running out of time. Uh, we don't have even time for discussion, uh, I just heard. But uh, this session was powered by the Global Gas Center, which is a platform for discussions. I'm sure that the Global Gas Center in the near future we will uh, have uh, plenty of opportunities for uh, experts and analysts, uh, high-level analysts like we saw today, to uh, put their, uh, and their uh, fingers uh, into uh, the, uh, the recent and forecasted development in the LNG and gas business. Uh, by the way, let me say two words about the Global Gas Center, and with this I conclude. The Global Gas Center uh, is based in Geneva and has uh, many of the main uh, gas players around the world. Uh, it is really uh, uh, playing a, uh, an increasing role in the gas business uh, around the globe. And uh, as you can see, they are powering uh, such discussion sessions. And in the future, near future, you will hear plenty of uh, new events 
uh, talking about the different aspects of the gas industry, the global gas industry. Thank you so much. And with this, I conclude the session. Thank you.